team. So nice to have all of you back, all 10 or less of you. I'm excited about that. Excited to be here with the rest of you. Well, recently I was made aware of a very unique headline. I'm just going to read you the headline. You ready? British court rejects transgender man's appeal to be listed as a father. Okay, now if you're like me, the headline lost you somewhere. So let me clarify. What the headline is describing is an individual labeled as a transgender man, meaning it's someone who was born biologically as a woman. Uh, This person gave birth to a child, and this person uh, desires to be labeled as the child's father because this person has pursued uh, becoming a male. Now, on the one hand, that that really should seem crazy to us. It should uh, provoke also our compassion for this person who's so confused in the basic identity uh, that God has given them. They have obviously no anchor in Christ. It should also make us aware that the reality is this is not an isolated incident. This is not an aberration to society today as it would have been even a decade ago. The bending of morality through the distortion of reality has become normal. Something as clear and simple as birthing a child is now subjected to the whims of society's opinions on gender, roles, creation, expectations, all of those things. The me monster has mounted the throne and nothing, not religion, not God, not biology, not even common sense, not common grace, nothing can stop this trend until Christ returns. So what do we do? I'm going to make the case today that if mothers function like God intends mothers to function, we can watch the ripple of righteousness flow through the generations and begin to push against the tide of evil. Ladies, I'm not only going to talk about moms today. I'm going to talk to ladies. Because ladies, you have a high calling that is supremely valuable and infinitely worthy because the eternal God receives glory through your lives. You know, I I get bothered by celebrity Christian commentators. And part of it's my pride because I'm proud. But part of it's just that sometimes I wonder what in the world they're talking about. I see this unsolicited advice of Christian commentators, uh, and they say things like this around Mother's Day. Oh, don't tell moms that they need to be good moms because it's hard to be a mom. And if you, if you hurt their feelings, it'll hurt their self-esteem. They already have a really hard job, and then they're going to feel like they're failing. And so no matter what, just encourage moms. What in the world? I, I do plan to encourage you today, but let's be real. We need you desperately. Sisters, you're half the kingdom. Technically, if we counted, probably a little more than half. We desperately need you to function in the plan of God, for the glory of God, for the kingdom of God to advance through our collective labors. And moms, why in the world would you really want a role that is so insignificant in the eyes of so many that as long as you just keep your life in somewhat of an order and avoid the major meltdowns, then the kingdom will advance without you just fine? That's ridiculous. That mentality minimizes the beauty and the glory and the essential nature that God has infused into the role of a woman, that he's designed for your good and for his glory. When you look to God's word, you find the beauty of womanhood. And you see the eternal weight of glory that God has woven into the very fabric of a woman's identity. And some of it, as our culture celebrates today, comes from being a mom. But being a biological mom is not the only thing that makes a woman's role glorious. God's design, God's intent, God's providential outworking of his glory through women is what makes being a woman glorious. And so today we'll take a look at one aspect of womanhood in particular, being a mom. We'll do a little tracing through God's word and see what God has to say about motherhood. We're going to think through motherhood from a fatherly perspective. And maybe you're wondering, why? Is it because it's Mother's Day? Well, that's, that's part of it. But more importantly, you won't hear the glory of womanhood or the beauty of motherhood anywhere but God's word. The world is confused, lost, in despair. 
But God's word provides hope and purpose for women. And all of us need to hear this. Old men need to continue to honor the pursuits of their wives in motherhood. Older women need to recognize how desperately our young moms need to hear the truth about the glory of motherhood so that they can speak truth and train our young women in righteousness. Young boys still at home, they need to respect their mom's great position in God's kingdom. Young men need to see what they should be looking for in a wife. Young husbands need to realize the role that God has given their wives supersedes any personal expectations they have for their wife. And young girls need to stop being filled with a cultural waste, thinking that a job or a career could ever replace what God offers to his daughters in the creational role he has crafted for them. And then there's the moms. Right now, in the thick of the battle, moms, the kingdom desperately needs you to be all that God has created you to be. Because, sisters, it's incredible to be a mom. It's amazing what God produces through your faithfulness to him. Because as we'll see, God brings forth from your faithfulness his eternal glory. You can call it wiping noses. You can call it being a chauffeur. You can call it uh, being a short order cook. But in God's economy, God calls it glorious. So today I want to talk about what God says about motherhood. I want to think through motherhood from our father's perfect perspective. And don't worry, moms, I'm not going to tell you how to be a mom. That wouldn't be a sermon. That would be a one-hour comedy lesson. But I will tell you why you should be a mom and find your fulfillment in being a mom. As we think through motherhood, go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1, God, with just enough information to whet our appetite, reveals his transcendent ability and his awesome power. He does it through creation. He creates everything by his words, from his person, out of nothing in the moment that he ordains it. And with all his incredible creative glory on display in the heavens above and on the intricacies of the earth set in order, God decides at the end of the sixth day to put a capstone on his creation. And so stand with me as we read our launching point for this morning's message and we see of God's glory through the creation of humanity. Let's read Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 31. Genesis 1, beginning at verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27. And so God created man in his own image, in the image of God He created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed and its fruit. You shall have them for food and every beast of the earth and every bird of the heavens and everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life. I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And there was evening And there was morning, the sixth day. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'll help us this morning to recognize the weight and the glory of your creation, to see uh, the image that you've imprinted into the role of women clearly. Help it to humble us. Help us to come under it. Help us to recognize its beauty, to see its power, to understand its purpose. Father, you have been so kind to give us all that we could possibly need 
in your word, and so often we run from this source to that source to find what only you provide. So I pray that you'd help us this morning, Father, to see in your word the truth we so desperately need. Help us to order our lives after what you've given us. Father, I pray that as, as we recognize the weight and the beauty that you've placed onto women, that it would encourage them to see the, the incredible way you've placed responsibility at their feet to live for your glory. Father, for the rest of us, may it humble us. May it cause us to serve them as they serve you. Father, may we all submit to your truth for your glory and for our good. We ask in our Savior's name. Amen. Well, thank you. You can be seated. As we think through motherhood from God's fatherly perspective, the first thing I want us to focus on, and actually the majority of our time will be spent here, I want us to see the beauty of God reflected in the design of motherhood. The beauty of God reflected in the design of motherhood. As we uh, read Genesis chapter 1, who's creating? Okay, if, you, if you just kind of uh, get sloppy, you can say, well, God's creating. Uh, but what does this Genesis account tell us about God? For nitpicky, notice in verse 26, we're told what about God? Genesis 1, 26. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Okay, now either God has a mouse in his pocket or God is in some fashion, not yet revealed in Genesis, God is in some way existing in plural essence. We understand this to be the foundation of the Trinity. Through, throughout Revelation, it clarifies the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all one God. And we'll talk about this more over the coming weeks as we consider how God exists in eternal Trinity. One God, fundamentally, purposefully, actively, life-giving, especially love-giving here in this passage, expending of himself as God. That's who God is. So you think about it, for God to be eternal, and for God to be within himself fully satisfied, perfectly glorified, and then create, what does that mean about his creation? Did God somehow need that creation to be fully, perfectly satisfied in himself? Absolutely not. It's impossible for God to need so the question is, why? Why would a God fully capable of eternal joy, fully capable and able to satisfy himself, why would he create? If God has all he needs, then his creation could not fill a void of God. Therefore, God's creation was an act of what? Love. An act of beneficial effort on behalf of another. More even than his identity as creator, more even as his identity as ruler and sovereign is God's identity as giving. Everything that God does, gives. It displays who he is. Does it display his glory? Absolutely. But not because there's a deficit in his glory that needs filled. He expends of his infinite worth and his infinite glory and power and goodness. That's what he does. He needs nothing. So what he does benefits who? Us, his creation. He gives everything. And in that giving, he displays his glory. You see that in the love of the Father, giving and sending his son, his beloved son to earth. You see that in the loving son who gives his life as a ransom for those who are his enemies. And you see the giving, loving nature of God as the spirit of God indwells the people of God and seals them for eternal redemption. But we all know the wonder and the beauty and the glory of Genesis chapter 1 changes by the time Genesis chapter 3 rolls around. And some suggest that with the coming of sin, that the roles uh, that God has provided for man and woman, man to keep and tend the garden, woman to help and love her husband and honor and glorify God by being a conduit for God to fill his earth. Somehow, sin has corrupted that and made it an unworthy pursuit, and therefore don't worry about it. Well, I don't think so. In fact, if anything, sin has magnified the need for women to be moms. Why? Well, because the beauty of God is reflected in the design of motherhood. If you've ever been privileged to see a, a mom give birth, the, the weight of that moment hits you as an infinitely valuable soul is born 
from the mother's womb, and comes eternally vibrant, endlessly precious creature destined to display the glory of God. It's unbelievable. Got to see it five times. That's enough. It's incredible. By the giving, loving action of a mother carrying her child, growing from herself through toil and pregnancy to offer God a, a baby, it's amazing. And then to grow that child, to shape that child, to see and understand God and to follow God, it's incredible. I'm afraid because it's common that we've let the commonness dull the beauty of what God has designed for his daughters to do. Think about the dignity that God immediately infused into motherhood after the fall. You can take that quote off there. It's going to distract me. <laughs> it's supposed to come way later. That's my fault. Just let the cat out of the bag. But anyway, that's all right. The giving action, the loving action of a mother carrying her child. How, how does this happen after sin? Well, God immediately infuses into motherhood a beauty after sin. God says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, he says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Okay, so what happens, remember the story, Eve eats the fruit, whereas Adam, well, he's failing to protect his wife. Adam sins, Eve sins, everybody sins, and what does God do? Well, he immediately extends grace. There is immediate grace in the moment of sin. They didn't die. That moment they tasted the forbidden fruit, they, they, instead they lived long enough to understand their sin, to hear their only hope, to understand that something was coming for them. But pay attention to where that hope comes from. If you trace this through the story of Genesis, in the midst of the serpent's curse, God says, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, I will put enmity between you, talking to Satan, and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So, so imagine that for just a moment. What would Eve have heard? If you, if you just offended the eternal God of, of the universe, if you'd just been made clear to you exactly what you had done that was so evil, you'd be listening for any clues of a postponement of your death. And Eve got one. God says there will come from Eve a Savior who will bruise the head of the serpent. I mean, that is one heck of a birth announcement. You cannot top that. Hey, Eve, by the way, from you... Here you go. But when all hope seems lost, when all innocence has fallen to the earth and begun to rot, when the future looks like it's fallen into chaos and evil, God says, Eve, you're going to have a baby. We often focus on the promised pain of childbirth, but the pain, through the pain, there would be life. And in the family line of Eve, there would come a baby who would one day conquer sin and Satan and evil and death. Friends, from the beginning, God made much of the role of motherhood and used it as a tool in his redemptive plan. Adam, he's finally sobering up from his sinful apple schnapps in Genesis 3.20. He says to Eve, I'm going to call you Eve because you're the mother of all living. It kind of dawned on Adam just how important Eve was and how important her role in defeating Satan's schemes would be. Death was the product of the curse because of sin. The, the result is the wages of sin earns us death. We're all destined for death except for what God has said in the garden has come true. Eve gave birth and through her and so many other women surrendering to God, raising their children, pointing them at God. We see the line of Christ develop. It developed through slavery. It developed through the covenants. It developed through the wilderness wanderings. It developed through blessings. It developed through exiles, through hardships until another young woman is employed by God to carry God's very own son. If God was just done with the role of women in Genesis chapter 3, Jesus would have just came down from heaven as a full-grown man. But God always, because of the self-depleting and the self-sacrificing, other-loving role of a mom, God has always shown the role of mother as worthy and wonderful. 
God's kind intention and design in creating women allowed for, even after the, the fall, a rebellious and selfish mother to have an instinct to fight through the suffering of childbirth to bring forth the beauty of a little soul. God created women with this heart of affection to one degree or another uh, to love and care for the helpless. And infused into women is the patience necessary to care for a helpless little selfish pagan, I mean person. Where does that come from? I'll give you a hint. It's not foreign to our heavenly father. It comes from him. It's a reflection of his design and his character in the role of a woman. Flip all the way to Titus chapter 2. In Titus chapter 2, Paul gives us such a beautiful picture of the life of a woman devoted to God. And Paul begins in, in verse 3, talking to older women. He, he says, older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They're to teach what is good. Okay, so, so Paul says, look, older ladies, this is what I want you to grow up to be like. I grow into an older woman who's above reproach and grow into an older woman who's able to, to teach younger women. A, a summary of Paul's commands for older women would be to live like Jesus and talk like Jesus. That's, that's what Paul wants of older women. But notice the subject of what the older women are to teach younger women about. Verse 4, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. See, older women are called to more than just a modeling of godliness, but a training of godliness, actively assessing the needs of younger women, helping them grow, teaching them, training them in what God has called them to do. They're called to be a, a disciple in a familial setting with familial goals. To train young women to love their husbands and to love their children. And get this, this isn't a sibling style love. Uh, this isn't a, a sensual style love. This is a God styled love. Young women are to learn from older women and actively display to their husbands and their families an agape love. This is the love that caused the father to send the son into the world that would kill him. This is the love that caused Christ to leave heaven. This is the love that caused Christ to endure the humiliation of humanity. This is the love that caused Christ to, to move from the infinite to the infant. This is the love that caused Christ to minister among the lowly, the outcasts, the sinners, the forgotten, the abandoned. This is the love that caused Christ to every day march in obedience toward Jerusalem. This is the love that caused Christ to endure mock trials and beatings and crucifixion for you. This is the love that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is the love that caused the Spirit to bring you the gift of faith that you could never earn. This is the love that God uses to seal us for eternity, guaranteed for Him. This is the love that causes older women to show younger women how to love terrible husbands. Whether strife or sin or he's not a believer, this is the love that motivates the life of a, of a woman. This is the love that causes older women to display Jesus and teach Jesus in a way that younger women desperately want to be the best moms they can be. This is the love that motivates the life of a woman. And this love only comes from God. This love is only seen perfectly in God. That's why the beauty of the design of motherhood is it displays the beauty of God. When Paul tells young women, love their husbands and children, be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. He's, he, he's not pushing you into the corner of an archaic cultural institution so that you can't be all you can be. That's a stupid lie of our culture acting as a mouthpiece for Satan. If you want to see God's glory on display in your life and in your family and in your marriage, then do what God says. Love like God loves. Sacrifice like God sacrifices. Serve like God serves. And give yourself like God has given of himself and then be prepared to be fulfilled. Paul is very clearly placing the emphasis on a common woman's life in the home with her husband and her children. As a young preacher, I occasionally say things that get me into trouble. And I imagine myself here like I'm in a 1980s action flick 
maybe set in the Vietnam War, and I'm about to step onto a landmine, and you hear that, that click. And all the guys in the platoon, they look, and everybody knows what's about to happen, and how's he going to get off? Well, the boot just came down, and there's a click. So what's the click? Well, ladies, young women, older women, females, what is the normal pursuit of honoring and glorifying God for a woman? It's being a wife, it's being a mom, it's staying home, and making the home your slice of the kingdom that you pour your life into. Our culture hates this. And I'm afraid our Christian culture, by and large, hates it as well. But sisters, this is God's best for you. So pour out your life in love to God through your husband and through your children. Does that mean it's going to be easy? Does that mean it's going to be peachy? Does that mean it's going to always feel good? Well, let me ask you, was Jesus' ministry always peachy? Did Jesus' ministry always feel good? Why would moms expect, uh, moms and wives expect a daily battle for the glory of God to be easy when we consider our king? And so older women promote the beauty of being a homemaker. Teach younger women how to make that life wonderful, not for themselves and not for their kids and not for their husband, but for Christ who died for them. Younger women, stay home and live out what God has said is best for you. And before you email me, can a woman, especially a mom, work outside the home and honor God? Yes. I think there's biblical precedent for it. Proverbs 31 shows a, a very industrious woman, Ruth. Well, not a mom yet, she worked outside the home doing a man's job. Circumstances often dictate difficult things like that. That's great. So ladies, you don't need to think of the home as a confining area, but the home is a home base for family life and ministry. If you're going to have a job that isn't mom and wife, then it cannot be, okay, you ready? It cannot be taking your ability to love your husband and your children in an agape, God-like fashion away from God's kingdom. If it is, it's sin. If you need a career and not a family, if that's your choice and not the circumstances of God that have pushed, pushed that upon you, then the responsibility is on you to defend it. God has since creation extolled the beauty of motherhood. Be a mom. Don't just have babies, but be a mom. Maybe I hear the grumblings like, our family needs the money. I get it. I remember 10 years ago when we were living in Los Angeles, I was finishing seminary. I was working at a construction company. We were traveling to raise support for missions, and our first little bundle of bills arrived. I mean, a baby arrived. And I remember when the reality of my wife not having a paycheck sunk into me, that money that we got from my job evaporated like our first case of diapers. I understand Every family is unique. Every situation is different. But husbands, if your wife is a mom and you're not letting her be a mom, you're keeping her from living out what God has called her to do, change. Trim your budget. Move to a cheaper house. Skip the vacation. Make God's priority your priority. God wants his daughters to be actively, aggressively, passionately, purposefully raising his next generation no career can match that. There is no chance that you have one that I haven't thought of. It will not happen. If you disagree, you're wrong. Can moms work? Sure. Husbands, can your wife be a mom to the agape level and a wife to the agape level and work as the head of the house? That's a question for you. Moms, can a mom work outside the home? I think that's the wrong question. Instead, what does God desire me to be as a mom? That's the right question. If your kids look at you as an engineer who's also called their mom, to me, that's a problem. If your kids look at you as their mom who desperately loves them and sacrifices for them by working her tail off and also loving them in a godly way, always putting them first because they're her divine responsibility and joy, then I think working outside the home is reasonable. But I don't see how biblically you could say it's best for your family to be a career woman who also produces children but has them raised by other people. That won't be fulfilling because you're designed to be a mom. That won't be successful for your kids because they're designed to be raised by their moms and their dads. So sisters, embrace God's best 
and pursue the life of a wife and a mom. And husbands, do everything you possibly can to make sure your wife is able to be the mom that God has designed her to be. I'm saddened by the feminist garbage of our culture leaking into the church to somehow cause women to think that their God-ordained roles as a wife and a mom is not in eternally significant enough to overcome the temporary need to satisfy the desire of worth in a company or a title or a position. A feminism seeks to set women free from what God has designed women for. Nothing will ever be ultimately fulfilling apart from God's plan. Ladies, you will never be praised by heaven any more than when you're living out the role of wife and mom. If your job or your part-time job or your career gets in the way of who God has asked you to be, you should quit. And you can disagree. That's fine. You can set up an appointment with me this week. Just call the office, ask for Pastor Blake, blake at gbzhutch.com. You're welcome to do that. But I'm not done yet. Again, I want you to see God's design for women. This is, this is better than anything the world has to offer. Turn to Song of Solomon. You know it's going to get good now. So it's Song of Solomon. I love how God's word describes godly, desirable women. Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 4. Listen to this. You are beautiful as Terza, my love, lovely as Jerusalem, awesome as an army with banners. Do you hear what Casanova is saying here? Do you, do you, do you get it? You, you're tender, you're lovely, you're beautiful, and you've got grit. You're an awesome as an army with banners. The Bible doesn't promote lace and feather princesses. The Bible says women have an extremely difficult and essential role to play in God's kingdom, and those who are extolled are those who fight for what God has for them. Look at a few verses later, chapter 6, verse 10 of Song of Solomon. Who is this who looks down like the dawn, beautiful as the moon, bright as the sun? Uh, Solomon's saying she's got the goods, okay? She's beautiful, no doubt. But then in the end, he he says this again. She is awesome as an army with banners. What's an army with banners? Well, uh, simply, it's an army that's fixing to kick some tail. Uh, God's beauty, his power and love are reflected in the design of a godly wife and mother. You can't tell me that if God allows there's anything more worth your devotion than that. If you think women in general are weak or moms are destined for frailty, read your Bible. Women are to be industrious. Women are to be productive. Women are to be strong. The character of God is reflected in the life of a woman. I think because God is Father, we just somehow assume that the role of a mom just must be necessary, but somehow it's just kind of an add-on because God's the Father, and so mom's like, well, we need him? Oh, Nothing could be further from the truth. What a woman does as a mother is display the tender heart of affection that God has for his people. Remember the heart of God that brings us comfort is often revealed in the heart of a Christian mother. The Bible takes the heart of a mother and then uses it as an illustration of God's tender love for us. One great example is Isaiah chapter 66, verse 13. God wanted to illustrate his tenderness, his love for his people. So he says this, as one with whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you, and you'll be comforted in Jerusalem. See, God is our Father, but that does not mean moms don't also display God's glory in their love. God's women are beautiful and relentless and warrior-like and tender, and their love never stops. That's, that's a mom. That's also how God loves When has God's love given up on his people? When has God's love settled for the evil of his people? When has God's love found an obstacle which he uh, wouldn't traverse for his people? Never. What's that sound like? That sounds like a mom's love for her child. Moms, live that out in front of your kids. Uh, We all desperately need to see it, whether we're your children or We're just observers. I want you to go to what Jesus says, John chapter 15 and verse 
13. John 15 and verse 13. I, th- I think if we're to categorize the struggles I, I hear about from moms, moms of babies and moms of high schoolers, all everything in between, the biggest I hear is simply the total life demand of being a mom. It's a lot. It's draining. It's grueling. It's hard. Now, there's a feeling of, of danger, like moms are self-deleting, not just self-depleting, but like they're, they're, they're losing themselves in this thing called motherhood. They're being swallowed up by tiny little people. Okay? Well, read with me. John chapter 15, verse 13, and apply it to moms. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Do you see the application to being a mom? To be a mom is to have your daily life, your daily schedule, your daily activities. It, just, it, it, it gets turned into pouring out of yourself for the people that you serve. At the very heart of motherhood is sacrifice. In fact, I'm not sure if any role in humanity, in the, in the scope of humanity, matches the reality of sacrifice like motherhood. But notice where the Bible apologizes for that. It doesn't. It extols it. It says this is beautiful. It says this is God honoring and this is wonderful. Sister, God has designed beauty into the self-deleting characteristics of motherhood. So don't feel the need to diminish the sacrifice of motherhood and don't for a moment despise it because it's not the heart of the curse but the beauty of God. It's the picture of Christ to your people that you call children. Now you can look at that quote. Kristen Weatherell, a mom and an author, had this very instructive and honest thought on this reality. Motherhood requires daily self-sacrifice, dying to self, And dying never feels good. Dying feels like death. Ladies, I'm guessing you can identify with that. If you identify with that feeling, then trace that feeling to the beauty of the cross and the glory of God in your life. The world says to devote your life to your young family seems eh, short-sighted. You know, kids are going to grow up, and then you're left without a career. You'll be passed on by the corporate world. So why would you sacrifice all that for them? Yuck. God says, woman, hear my souls that I love. Care for them. Love them. Raise them. Die to yourself for their good and my glory. I don't think any career is worth abandoning God's glory in the pursuit of motherhood. But do you believe it? Husbands, is your wife in a position uh, to be able to pour her life into the role that God has given her? Ladies, is the role of mom ultimately satisfying to you? If you need an outlet for creative or organizational things, I mean, go for it. But if your outlet is a career that takes you away from truly pouring out agape love onto your children and into your family, then there's a heart issue that needs addressed. And sister, the church, the kingdom, desperately needs you to train our next generation to live for Jesus. So, please... See the beauty of God reflected in the design of motherhood and pursue it with your whole life. Thinking through motherhood from God's fatherly perspective, second, we should embrace the disconnect between design and reality. Let me explain that just a bit. God's design in the garden was for a man and a woman to have children and live for eternity. That is obviously not what happens What should that tell you? Well, it should tell you that nobody, no man, no woman is perfectly living under God's design. Adam abdicated his authority. Eve usurped God's role. And here we are living under the curse with the weight of its consequences. This side of Genesis chapter 3, there's going to be obstacles, trials, struggles. Ladies, you can't overcome them, but Christ can, and he does. The hard reality of the curse is that some of you are unable to have children, Maybe some of you have chosen not to get married. Maybe some of you have been prevented from marrying for another reason. And maybe some of you have seen your marriage dissolve or fail, whether through a messy divorce or death. 
sister, understand that God has been working through non perfect, non-ideal, non-desirable situations of our lives for 6,000 years. He understands your situation. Your worth to God is found in His creation of you in His image. His kind grace predestined you from ages past to hear the call through the Spirit, to be empowered by the faith that God gives, to believe in the Son that God has provided, the one who came from heaven to die on the cross for your sins. If you do what? If you repent and believe. And then you're truly adopted as a beloved daughter of God, a princess of His, the true King, that's your ultimate worth. To lose sight of that makes a wonderful thing that we can call uh, being a wife or a mom. That turns that into an idol. Your identity is found in Christ. No, no matter if you have seven kids or have never been able to have kids. They're a blessing. Yes, they're God's kindness. Yes, but children are in no way an exclusive means of God's kind grace. To put your worth wholly on God's provision of a spouse or provision of children disregards the beauty of the personhood God has provided to you in the work of his son for his glory. It's like saying that the death of our Savior was great, but not quite enough for me. Whether you're young and wishing away the present while you wait for your Prince Charming, or you're older and you've put yourself on a shelf to await uh, to await heaven, thinking that God didn't give you a family, therefore He doesn't expect anything from you, sisters, understand that you need to embrace the disconnect between design and reality. What do I mean by this? We'll turn to Mark chapter ten. We have a interesting story here. I want to pluck it out of its context and apply it to us in regards to families in the kingdom. Mark chapter 10, verse 28 to 30, shows Peter kind of straining his arm a bit to pat himself on the back after Jesus calls discipleship, Jesus called a discipleship. And, and Peter says, see, we've left everything and followed you. In verse 29, Jesus says, truly I say to you, there's no one who's left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. What could that possibly mean for Mother's Day? Well, friends, Jesus in the context of pride and sacrifice tells us that nothing natural that we give up or don't receive or sacrifice can be compared to the spiritual blessings we have in Christ. So if circumstances or maybe godly pursuits have caused singleness or have caused a life without children, Jesus says, look, sister, in me, the family you have now is truly better. And in the age to come, it's, it's, it's going to be perfect. Jesus said it. So do you believe it? If you've chosen not to compromise and marry outside of God's design and you're single, Jesus says, well done. Who cares what the world says? If you don't have children in your marriage, but you wish you could look around the church, Jesus says, hey, they can be yours. I mean, I've got a few I'd occasionally borrow out, but really in seriousness, your life didn't escape God's providence. It was how he crafted you as for the purpose that he designed you for to be how you are. Understand that in Christ, we're able to have and be what we need and what we're designed to be even if not in the natural family, we have it in our spiritual family. I've been blessed with a, a wonderful, loving, wise, self-sacrificing, godly mother all my life. And I wouldn't be who I am without her influence or her love or her sacrifice for me. And in addition to her, at many times in my life, I've had more than one mother, sometimes too many mothers, but at least more than one. In fact, the most difficult situations in my life, I can look back and see the activity of other older godly women in my life acting in a spiritual mother sense in really profound ways. Here in this church, I felt that through different trials. Ladies encouraging me in ways that only mothers are designed to do, and they weren't my mom. The ministry of an older lady in Christ to a younger man in Christ can and should be significant. Different than an older woman to a younger woman, but still essential. 
If you're an older woman in a grace group, look around and find in the younger men sons to care for. You should see sons and daughters. Sons and daughters to love. Sons and daughters to serve. Sons and daughters to admonish and rebuke. I remember when Amy and I, we'd just been married about four weeks. We went on our honeymoon. We went on a mission trip to Albania, which that was a mistake, but that's for another time. We were living with Burton and Dolores, an older couple, because I'd lost my job. Minor detail. Right before we got married, I'd gotten fired. And I didn't have a job at that point, and Amy did. So one day as I was walking Amy to the door, out the door, so she could go to work, I gave her a smooch. There goes my sugar mama to do her job. Well, I looked for one. I turned around to see Dolores looking down over the balcony at me. And she said, "Um, do you have a job? To which I replied, I'd been looking and diligently so. And she replied, oh, you don't have a job, but you need a job. So go to Ralph's, Kroger's, and bag groceries until you get a better job. Husbands have jobs. And she smiled and turned around and walked away. Oh, I needed that. She reminded me, husbands have jobs. She's the sweetest woman you've ever met. But she took a giant red stamp and marked pending on my man card. She said, look, this is what men do. So do it. She functioned as a godly spiritual mother. Ladies, if you don't fit the traditional bio mom profile, God still has sons and daughters all throughout this church who need you. Remember, one of the kindest, gentlest, most obvious, caring things Jesus did at the end of his earthly life, there he was on the cross, and he looks down, and he finds John, and he finds his mom, and he says, John 19, 27, Behold, your mother. Why did Jesus do that? I've wondered that. I mean, could it have been to care for Mary? Sure, absolutely. But what about John? Could it have been for John? I mean, John had a good mom. I think Jesus understood the reality of what they both needed. He put them together. You don't have to go to the hospital pregnant and come home with a baby to be an amazing mom. At times, you just need to embrace the disconnect between design and reality. Understand that you can pursue the heart of motherhood with those whom God has providentially placed in your life. I'm uh, out of time, and I have two more points It'd probably be better learned from a godly woman anyway, so I'll sum them. There are very practical reminders that all the difficulties of motherhood offer you a teaching tool for the gospel. First, for your own heart. Second, for those around you who are your children. And last is just a call to never give up, to chase the purpose of God's design for you to bring Him glory through dying to yourself and living for your Savior from diapers to diplomas and beyond. Being a bio mom, being an adopted mom, being a spiritual mom is an eternal title. God's eternal glory is tied to your role as a mom. Ladies, understand God has what God has given you in the home. Your role as a wife and a mom is something nothing in the culture or the world can ever match. You bear the stamp of God's great glory and his power and his love and his tenderness and his ferocity and his mercy as a mom made in his perfect image. Nothing could be more wonderful. And church, may we all promote this role that God has given to all of our women with all the glory that it entails as we trust God to strengthen his families and his kingdom workers through his moms. May we see them as fierce and beautiful women working for the glory of God. Let's pray. Father, as we consider the truth of your word, the realities of your call in the lives of women, I pray that we do it with humility. I pray that we recognize the great difficulty that the circumstances of this life places on so many. I pray that we do it with a heart of help, Father, I pray for these ladies who struggle daily through the junk of being a mom that's so necessary that they would be encouraged, that they would see that they have an eternal work, one that bears fruit for your glory throughout all eternity. Father, may we as men and husbands come alongside our moms 
care for them, encourage them, lift them up, show them the beauty of what God has called them to be. Father, we thank you for this day that we get the opportunity to thank our moms. We praise you for the work that you've done through them. We ask this in our Savior's name for your glory. Amen.